All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Jennifer will be monitoring the chat and the participants to let people into the waiting room. And today we're just gonna take a little bit of time to recap last week's Member Summit, 2020 Member Summit, which I feel was a huge success. And based on the feedback, it feels like people appreciated it and enjoyed it and had a good time. So I'm gonna try and take us through three days of things that were done in about an hour. So clearly doesn't represent all the great conversations and discussions that took place, but hopefully gives people a flavor for what last week was like if you attended. So as is kind of the motto of the Consortium for Service Innovation, we really wanted to create a space for people to get away from their day-to-day -day world and maybe think about the future and have some time to explore. It's, very difficult to imagine what a future state might look like or to be innovative when we can hardly breathe from all the things that are coming at us every day in our work worlds. When we get together for a member summit, we like to say, let's create space to think. Since this was a virtual event, we said, let's create some time to explore it together. And it seemed like most people felt like they had that time to do some exploration, which we, we loved. It was over three days, four hours a day, uh, being virtual, trying to stay on a virtual session for seven or eight hours is fairly difficult to do. So we broke it up into four hour sessions with a mixture of presentations, but trying to create a lot of space for people to have discussions and think. So on the first day we did a few discussions, but then had the virtual water cooler where we broke people up into breakout rooms and just had some interesting discussions. The breakouts I were in centered around vacations, other ones maybe centered more around work, but really is just a time for people to get together and communicate and talk. On the Thursday, we did a full day of open space and I'll talk definitely more about some of the outcomes of open space and how that went. And then on Friday, back into some breakouts and presentations by uh, companies that are pushing the boundaries in certain areas and talking about how do you quantify some of the impacts of KCS, a lot of great content, a lot of discussions took place on Friday. One of the nice things being virtual in the chat windows and in other ways, we were keeping people connected. So there's a lot of side discussions taking place on the topic in the Zoom chat, as well as in a Slack workspace, which was interesting and fun to watch and was almost more engaging than maybe sitting in a large room together listening to somebody present. Some of the themes that developed and we're still digesting some of this, so we'll be thinking more about some of the themes that developed, but there was a, a clear thread around people that kept coming up and this heavy focus on the transformation that we're going through partly due to the COVID-19 impacts and this distributed workforce where most people are working from home around the world and what that means. But it's really talked a lot about how do we engage employees in new ways? What is it like being an employee, whether you're an executive or a new knowledge worker that just joined a company? How do I learn? How do I make connections? And this is a, a common theme that we heard during the presentations as well as open space and some of the side conversations. So an interesting shift away from technology into people. And we've been seeing that trend over the last year or two years, but it really came into focus probably in the last six months. And that was a, a big part of the discussions that took place last week and, and the theme that kind of went through. Some more specific themes or topics of discussion that were had is, you know, again, this virtual world's requiring more intentional connection when I used to be able to meet people at the water cooler, I would see people in the hallway, you could make those connections. And now those connections have to be intentional because I either have to arrange a meeting with somebody, I have to reach out to them through my Slack or Teams or some other methodology to try and make that connection. But we're, we're missing some of those catching up in the hallways, which is where some of the most interesting learnings take place in companies because it's an off the cuff discussion and now we need to be intentional about that. And it's making it harder in some organizations and some environments to get work done because now you're going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to you know WebEx meeting to WebEx meeting because as you try to engage with people, you have to have all these scheduled times. So people are feeling this overwhelming connection, but it's all just about work. So uh, interesting discussions that took place there. 
We also started to poke at our understanding of value and employee value was definitely a topic that was a thread and this tension that's developing between what is value versus outcome and that you can get value before you get an outcome. Maybe you can get value without an outcome. That's a, a topic of debate, but there's a tension between value and outcome, which I'll talk a little bit about, especially when we start thinking about the channels of connection we have and what are the values within a channel of connection. So what value do I get from a forum versus self-service portals versus live discussions and reaching those outcomes? You know, talking about people, uh, focusing on, you know, how you really think about the reputation of your people and that reputation, recognition, these things aren't about performance management, but are more about how we recognize contributions of people. Being clear about the audience we're talking to, designing for the extremes leaves out most people. Uh, in one of the presentations on designing a KCS badging system, Roman Garcia talked about this idea that you have to design for kind of the, the main people. If you ex design just for the extremes, you're leaving out the people in the middle. And those are the people that are actually going to be the ones that make you most successful. So how do you design for who you're talking to? Uh, Autodesk talked a little bit about, you know, building transition plans while you have strong support because it's hard to build a transition plan when all of a sudden you're caught off guard because a transition took place. <clears throat> Maybe a new executive comes in and if you didn't have some sort of planning and a new executive comes in and wants to go in a new direction, now you have to go do a whole bunch of planning where if you do that planning while you have strong support, it's easier to manage when change is, is happening. And this idea of time as the proxy of customer value and the knowledge time continuum, some, some interesting discussions were sparked around that. And these are themes that we're probably gonna try and organize and structure maybe in team meetings or some conversations with member companies, but a, a lot of interesting discussions took place. And like I said, we're still digesting them through all the chats and the slacks and everything else that we had going on. So, but these are some of the things that we pulled out since, since last week. <clears throat> uh, thanks to Sarah Feldman, we had a takeaways channel in a Slack domain. And so I captured some of the takeaways that, that people put in there, which I thought was a really good way to help capture some of the things that click in people's minds, whether they were super detailed or not detailed, but like Adam Mullen saying sufficient to calculate. It's just, it's an interesting thing that makes your mind think about a whole bunch of different things. And I captured Russ's because that was my favorite, a picture of his broken pen on his notebook because he couldn't write fast enough to scribble down everything that he was, he was learning. So I uh, took a screen capture of that because that was my, my favorite of the day <laughs> was his broken pencil on the, uh, on his notebook. So a little bit about the numbers. We had 150 people attend from over 50 different companies. So uh, great attendance, which felt like a good size because most people were able to communicate and it wasn't so large that people were lost in the shuffle, but um, you know, small enough that everybody can contribute and breakouts could be manageable. We could break people up into good sized groups to have discussions. 98 people joined the open space sessions on day two. We had a lot of consortium innovators engaged uh, and we had 32 KCS V6 certified trainers, which to me is an amazing number, just the fact that there are 32 KCS V6 certified trainers, but we had that many expertise uh, attending the meeting. So I came and began to talk about the level of engagement from the global community. It was, I shouldn't say surprising because there is, such a strong community around the consortium and the academy and KCS and intelligence swarming and all the topics that the membership talks about. But the level of engagement was off the charts. And that level of engagement started a couple of weeks before the member summit. And the excitement that we saw building up to the member summit was really nice to see, especially transitioning to a virtual environment where people have always enjoyed the member summit for getting together, seeing people that maybe you haven't seen for a year, having conversations with new people that are bringing new ideas and new perspectives to the membership and seeing that continuous and continue in this virtual environment really felt good. And it was 
something that I felt so much energy from and uh, appreciated and loved being a part of. Since it was virtual, we kind of had to have a new experience of engaging with members. So we uh, created a Slack workspace just for the member summit. Uh, 143 people joined it. It was a steady stream of communication. Some of it was fun. There was a whole lot of discussion about bacon. So we had coffee hour or half hour before the, the summit actually officially started. So lots of topics around breakfast if you were in North America and then the Europeans pointing out that they were having dinner, but you can have bacon for dinner too. So lots of, lots of fun things. Some of the KCS nerd and KCS confession, confessions channels were, were fun to monitor too, but people were in there all day long after the summit, before the summit, having discussions. There were posts today with people asking questions. So kind of a, a great platform. We use Zoom for the member summit and we use Zoom chat for questions, comments, and answers during the presentations, which offered up a whole new dynamic to the presentation where one or two people might be presenting and then two or three people from their company would be in the Zoom chat answering questions that came up throughout the presentation. So it was a, a new interesting way to have a fun dynamic and really have the audience participating in the presentation. And then after the presentation, some live Q and A, um, which worked out very well. We've used that kind of model in the KCS and action calls and carried that here. And it, it worked really well throughout the member summit to really have people be engaged and, and keep them going. It was so much fun as well to see so many people. We created some backgrounds that people could use that were for the member summit. And if you were a certified trainer or a consortium innovator on the staff, on the board of directors, you had your own little custom tag that you could have on your background. Um, there's a couple of those posted. If anybody on this call is interested in those, you can feel free to email us and Kelly can send off the, <laughs> the image for using for your Zoom background. But it was fun to see so many people using the background. And then it was fun to see all the other backgrounds that people were using. Um, so again, a, a high level of engagement. And I can't talk enough about how much fun everybody was having. Definitely serious conversations and great topics, but everybody was engaged and having a good time, which is really one of the things that makes this you know group of people slightly different than a lot of the other events that I go to where it's engaging with the people it's having everybody participate being able to have some fun it's not just presentation after presentation of a company explaining how everything they're doing is perfect most of it was we're doing this we're trying this here's the next things we're trying do you have suggestions where are you and just an exchange of information in a somewhat relaxed and casual environment where it felt like we were all together in a room, having a good time, working on interesting topics in an interesting space. And I just captured some of these images of uh, you know, people just having a good time, which I'm super excited to see that people were engaged and having a good time. We also announced a new consortium innovator in Laurel Portner. For, uh, for 2020, she's been an active member since 2009, has contributed heavily to the work of the consortium, has contributed to the Measurement Matters V6 paper, leveraging coaching programs, um, really did a lot with the evolution of our Evolve Loop thinking, and is somebody who just supports the community and is always willing to have discussions with people on a host of different topics. So congratulations again to Laurel for becoming a consortium innovator. And uh, she, we sent her the new background during the meeting so she could have her background say consortium innovator as well as being a KCS V6 trainer. So we did focus a lot on some of the topics going on around the industry. We spent some time discussing the way we organize the work with the consortium into these five buckets of knowledge centered service, intelligence swarming, the predictive customer engagement, the customer experience initiative, which kind of sits on top of everything since everything we're doing is about improving the customer experience 
and leadership in an adaptive organization. KCS is obviously the most known, it's more known than the Consortium for Service Innovation in the industry, the most mature. But we talked about how it's still evolving and there's still a lot of work being done to do things like move away from AQI to a content standard checklist. And members are continuing to question some of the uh, methodologies and question and push and move forward. So while it's the most mature, it's also still dynamic and still changing as we change as an industry. Intelligence swarming, we had a couple presentations on member companies that are implementing intelligence swarming and where they're really pushing the boundary and adding in reputation as one of the key pillars of intelligence swarming. We used to talk about intelligence swarming was made up of collaboration and then how you match work and people, but we've added reputation as one of maybe the top level core pillars because we used to put that under matching work to people, but getting that recognition system in place and understanding the value contribution of people is really one of the pillars of intelligence swarming. We're also updating the intelligence swarming framework to be a set of best practices and core concepts very similar to what KCS is. So over the next some number of months, I'm not gonna commit to anything, we'll be kind of pushing out some new documentation on intelligence swarming. The predictive customer engagement is always a hot topic around machine learning, AI, and what the predictive customer engagement has matured into is a way to think about how you can use these technologies more than it being a technology play. Um, we've really started to realize, like we do with everything, digital transformation, using machine learning, using AI is really about people more than the technology. The technology is leapfrogging, it's getting easier and easier. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's certainly getting easier. But how do you get people to engage in consuming information that are coming from ML and AI? How do you build a system around that? And how does that fit into your total customer strategy is, is a pretty interesting and hot topic. Leadership in an adaptive organization has become another topic in the leadership levels as we've gone to this distributed workforce and as everything has shifted in the last six months and the way people are interacting and connecting. And that goes true for management too. How do you really connect with and manage people when you have new employees starting that you've never met and you don't know when you'll get to meet them? How do you bring them into the fold? How do you bring a team environment together? So these things are all big topics that uh, leaders across organizations are discussing. And what does it look like as we move forward? There's lots of studies that have been done with CEOs saying they expect to ask less than 30% of their employees to come back into an in-office environment. And so that is gonna change the way we interact, the change the way we lead, the work around the adaptive organization fits into that very well and is something we'll continue to poke at with, with the membership. So the co-creation of value was a topic um, really thinking about based on service dominant logic and service as the fundamental basis of exchange instead of product that Every interaction point in delivering a service is actually an opportunity to create value. And this is where I talked about the tension between value creation and outcome, because I can create value before I get to an outcome. But I can only do that if I have a good fit between the customer and the product and a good fit between the customer and the employee. We expand employee to be channel. So it's not just a person to person, but a person interacting with the channel, self-service, forums, machine learning, you can gain value. But only if you have information exchange, collaboration and cooperation between the two parties, the parties being people and some something could be a channel or a technology. So we, we poked at this and talked about the value erosion model that the consortium has been using for years of, you know, this linear value erosion that occurs, but that is really for known issues, not new issues. And customer value is not linear, especially for new issues. Knowing what channel is best used to serve up a solution and knowing you can't control the channel a customer comes into, every channel has its own value erosion. Uh, and, you know, the example I like to use is I'm willing to poke around in self-service for quite some time, 
The example I used at the member summit was a sprinkler system I had put in, which became a running theme, which I didn't intend it to become a running theme through the member summit, but people kept talking about sprinkler systems. But if I'm interested in a topic and I, I'm not under a huge time constraint, I'm willing to poke around in the self-service on the web for quite a while to learn something. In a chat channel though, if I don't get what I want in the first three or four interactions in a chat, I start to get really frustrated. So I might, might be willing to spend a lot of time in self-service before I have erosion, but in chat, I have very fast erosion. Um, and this, these curves probably vary for every person. They vary depending on the severity or impact of an issue, um, but kind of a, a new approach that really was started by Peter Dixon at Ericsson in thinking about how you have to have value erosion in every channel. It's not just one linear value erosion. And along with that, as we think about the co-creation of value and that every interaction point, once I have a reason to interact, is an opportunity for me to create value as long as there's learning between the requester and the responder, we're willing to partner with each other in the approach to solving something and the intent is achieved in a timely manner, I can create value from issues. So it's not actually directly into value erosion, but I have the opportunity to create value but once I hit, I hit that maybe peak value, then value is going to start eroding because now it's taking too long to get me an answer. And how do you jump from one channel to the next channel since every channel has a peak value? If I'm reaching peak value in automation and I haven't gotten to my outcome yet, how can I move somebody to a new channel? You see this with chatbots where most companies have a way to say, oh, the chat in the chatbot's going too long get them out to another channel that isn't as smooth as it probably should be in most companies. And since we can't control the entry point for people, how do we understand those, those journeys? How do we understand when we should have somebody in a certain channel and move them from channel to channel, which sparked a lot of interesting discussions about the idea that channel success and channel value creation are not the same thing. And time is the ultimate proxy of value. So how do we understand the time somebody's willing to stay in a channel, getting value out of that channel before we move them to another channel or move them directly to talking to a human who can make a lot more intelligent decisions about how to interact with the person. And this is a topic that the members will be exploring through 2020 and into 2021. We're planning on having a team meeting where we'll start to kind of diving into some of these concepts a little bit deeper and working with member companies on it. But sparked interesting discussions and themes that carried throughout the rest of the member summit. So I was uh, excited by the level of engagement people had in this idea of what is value creation? Can you co-create it? And how do you manage it when you're dealing with all these different channels? And we can't impose our view of value on our customers and our customers view of value and our view of value is probably very different. I heard a super compelling story from Athena Health on how KCS helped Athena Health and helped the healthcare heroes out there during COVID-19. Uh, Kachina Miller did the presentation and then Adam Mullen helped with a lot of the questions in the chat window and then after the chat. But what a compelling story around how they could leverage and flex staff from non-support teams to help out, especially in the first few weeks and months of the COVID-19 pandemic when <clears throat> between January and February through their telehealth, um, I, I guess it's a product, they had 14 cases on COVID-19. And then in March to April, they jumped to 4,000, over 4,000 cases and had 13,000 internal article views of people trying to solve problems with KCS without having this robust KCS implementation where they could create new articles rapidly as they were learning in this very dynamic environment, pull staff in from other organizations to man the phones. They couldn't have reacted to the pandemic if they didn't have a KCS implementation. So a super compelling story about the power of KCS, but also about the power of how a company can react when something hits that nobody was anticipating. And Kachina talked about how 
like many companies, Athena has a disaster recovery plan, but the disaster recovery plan usually accounts for the fact that maybe there's a huge snowstorm in Maine and people can't come into the office, but then their other offices can pick up the workload, not where on a certain day in March, they were given 72 hours notice that everybody was gonna be working home everywhere in the world. They aren't prepared for that type of a disaster. And how they reacted to that was a very interesting story and really was compelling with, with the times we're in. So it was a, a great presentation. <clears throat> then we had Akamai talking about their intelligence swarming framework and how it's transforming their business. But underlying that was really the approach to change management and whether you're implementing intelligence swarming, KCS, or going through any change management, it talked about how to approach change management around the uh, with intelligence swarming being the change initiative that they were were implementing and they talked uh, talked about their three phase approach of engaging experts so how do you learn from other people we often talk about oh i've learned from all my experiences but i guess really smart people learn from other people's experience so how do they pull in information from the consortium, the consortium membership on what other people are doing to help them understand their journey before starting their journey. Then all of the organization change management activities they've done, which are, I would argue, industry leading and how they've approached it in not only being methodical, thinking through every step, but keeping it fun and keeping it lighthearted and engaging all the employees in a fun, lighthearted way, which makes people uh, more engaged. Then thinking about the architecture, thinking about what are the next steps? Uh, how are they building a reputation and a recognition model to recognize the people that are contributing? Overall feedback from the people engaged in the swarm has been great. And some of it is really the basis of intelligence swarming of, I have this access now to a large group of people that can give me answers instead of escalating it to somebody who now I get one person to help me, I can tap into this network of people. They're seeing some really exciting early results with a 20% drop in the length of the engagements they have. It takes about 16 minutes on average for somebody to respond to a swarm request and start working with somebody who is raising their hand to ask for help where in the old model, when they would escalate to their second line, it would be almost two hours before somebody would take the case that was being escalated. And then they really didn't even have a good way to track, well, from the time somebody accepted taking the case, when did they start to engage in actually solving the problem? So they went from two hours to 16 minutes in getting other people engaged to offer help on moving a ticket forward, which is to me, probably one of the biggest powers of intelligence swarming is that unbounded network you can create of people that can jump in to help. And if I'm not available to help, there's probably somebody else who's available to help. So that, you know, impact on your customer is just amazing. And I, and on your employees, if you think about the, uh, the angst that you have as an employee when you just need help and you're not getting the help and you can't find the help and you can't find the help and it's taking two hours before somebody is going to jump onto something with you or to help you or take something from you. Making that 16 minutes is really quite a, an achievement for Akamai. So great presentation by Akamai on their change management and what they're doing with intelligence swarming. So that was kind of day one. So day one, we talked about value creation and co-creation of value, which sparked a lot of interesting discussion. Saw a couple presentations, one from Athena Health and one from Akamai. Then we had a virtual cooler or a vir virtual cooler hour or coffee hour with people breaking up into rooms and having interesting discussions. Day two was all open space. Uh, 17 topics identified and defined by 98 attendees. We had more than 17 topics, but then we merge them together if they're alike. And the theme was, you know, dreaming is a form of planning. And what are we dreaming about together? Uh, which some of the topics had to do with that and some did not, but that's the point of open space. Open space is designed to say, what do you as a, a group of people want to talk about? What do you find interesting? And let's go talk about those things. It was very successful as a virtual environment. We had run open space sessions in some of the team meetings with maybe 20 people, but scaling it from 20 people to 98 people, I will admit we were nervous about how well that would work. And it was very engaging. 
people self-selected topics using Zoom breakout rooms so that people could move from room to room using the law of two feet maybe the law of clicking your finger at this time, but if you weren't enjoying a conversation, you could go and jump to a different discussion. And we have pages and pages of notes that we need to digest and pull things out of and reach out to people and try and understand more what they're, they, uh, they may be meant by some of the comments in the notes. But some of the topics we talked about, it was a broad range of topics, uh, things around the KCS Council, what should leaders be thinking about, you know, metrics, uh, intelligence swarming. So a host of topics that were covered in the open space sessions. And all of this, uh, these notes are available on the members only wiki. So, the, um, you know, if you want to go poke around in there, you can find these and kind of read through the notes. Really some nuggets, gold nuggets of information in a lot of these notes. And then some things that are confusing me that I need to go figure out what they mean. But that's the fun of open space. And I would say that because it was virtual, the notes are much more detailed than when it's in person and people are scribbling in a notebook and handing us a piece of paper at the end. So uh, definitely one of the benefits we saw is the capture of knowledge was much higher in this virtual environment than maybe in a in-person environment. So we're going to look at open space and see how we might be able to leverage this more throughout the year and not have it be just a one-time event or in team meetings, but could we design doing open space as something we invite people to? It's similar to the open tables that we've done for the KCS Academy. Um, the open space or the round tables for the KCS Academy are a little more prescriptive in the topics uh, as opposed to the group defining the topics. But we're finding when people get together, they do amazing things and have awesome conversations. And we want to try and continue to build that environment. So we might be looking at playing with this over the next year as a virtual event. Definitely one of the things we liked about doing a virtual member summit, the reach of people was much higher and it was much easier for a broad group from around the world to attend, as opposed to could I get the travel budget and can I you know, take the time to travel to an event? Although everybody at the end said they still would like to do an in-person event. So we're definitely not looking at not doing in-person events, but we think this is a format that would scale and allow us to connect with a lot more people. On day three, we had four breakouts uh, that took place over two different time periods with uh, some focused on KCS and some focused on non-KCS. The badging program for sustaining KCS activities with Roman Garcia, I talked a little bit about it earlier, but PTC has had a KCS implementation for many, many years at a pretty large scale. How do you sustain that and the energy behind it when it's been in place for 10, 11, 12 years and you are, it's just how you do your job. It's no longer something new and exciting. So they're playing around with badging programs and sustaining their, those activities through badging programs. Laurel Portner presented on a human first approach to the organization network analysis. Uh, F5 has done some interesting work with uh, the ONA on how to select the coaches for their KCS program, but expanding that beyond just what they can kind of understand about the network of people, that the network of people that management think is rarely what is actually going on out there. And this is a technique to kind of uncover the network of how people are actually interacting. And great discussion on the importance of coaching and how to think about coaching and how to think about the network. Finding the Flow by Ludwig Hale and Mike West at Poly. So Finding the Flow is a model that talks about finding that balance between challenge and skill. If I'm asked to do something that isn't challenging, I'm very apathetic towards it. It's boring. I don't want to do it. If I'm asked to do something that is so far above my skill set that I get frustrated, that doesn't make me very active in wanting to opt in and participate. If you find the right balance between challenge and skill where I'm challenged to do it, but I have the skills to do it. I'm interested in it. You're finding the flow and Polly is using finding the flow to route work and training and think about what their employees are interested in working in because if you're interested in working in it, you're much more likely to get into the flow where time disappears, you're dedicated to it and you are much more motivated to participate and produce. 
And then from Nathan Chandler and Royce at Autodesk, quantifying the impacts of KCS, always a hot topic on how do I talk to the impacts of KCS. So great presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, they talked a lot about how do you plan for things? And if you have this ability to quantify the impacts, when change comes, it's easy to talk to the impacts of your KCS implementation. So great presentation by Autodesk. And these are just some of the comments that we pulled out of while the, the teams were talking. Because again, these weren't presentations saying, we've done everything perfect, look at us, everything is great, we're out to try and win an award for doing this. It was, these are things we're playing with, these are things we're testing, we'd love to hear other people's opinions. And it really gained a lot of attention from everybody on the phone. So I pulled out some of the comments that we saw as, uh, as we were going through the presentations. And again, all of these are gonna be posted to the wiki. The presentations and the recordings will all be posted on the members wiki. So then uh, Bit Rambush, the Vice President of eServices and Knowledge Management for Dell Technologies and I had kind of a, a casual conversation about communication across an enterprise. As you can probably imagine, communicating in an enterprise the size of Dell is a challenge when you have to think about how do I how do I discuss a change management initiative up to executives in getting the change approved, but also in sustaining it since, and I'm sure a lot of people on the phone have, have done this, you know, as soon as executives sign off on the budget for a program or agree to a program, they're on to the next big thing because they're looking not at next week, they're looking out a year. What are we doing next year? And so how do you continue to communicate because because you approved a budget does not mean the project's done. That means we're just starting the project. So how do you continue to communicate? And then how do you communicate down and out across all the knowledge workers? And in Dell, all the different organizations, and some of these organizations are thousands of people. I mean, they're the size of most large companies. So really interesting discussion. And what Bit really tried to impress on people is that one, you have to speak to the audience. One message does not you know, equal success across an entire enterprise. You can't talk to the uh, executives the same way you're gonna go talk to an individual contributor because the what's in it for me isn't clear if it's the same message. And so you have to ensure the why, what's in it for me is very clear, but based on the audience you're talking to, know who your stakeholders are, know who has your back, who doesn't have your back, who's on board, all of those things, and really creating a, a map of your stakeholders so you know who do I need to be communicating to more, who do I need to be prepared for, um, you know, to be a, a detractor or pushback from. Use an example of a meeting where they were presenting to some of the executives and one of them just said, I heard search doesn't work. And he's like, that just, kind of derailed the entire meeting because now you're trying to explain, well, search does work. What do you mean by search doesn't work? So, you know, making sure you understand all those stakeholders and what are their motivations. And so you don't walk into a meeting and kind of get blindsided by comments like that. And be consistent and repetitive. Um, we talk about this in some of the management workshops, but, you know, you may work on something for four months before you start communicating it out. So if you worked on something for four months or six months or a year, and then all of a sudden you go to a meeting and you communicate it, you can't assume that that one meeting means anything to anybody. You have to be repetitive and continue that message. And that message has to be consistent. It has to stay consistent over the long haul in order for people to absorb it. So, but it was a, a kind of casual, fun, uh, relaxing discussion between Bit and I and, you know, he has a lot of expertise on it. So it was fun to listen to him and his perspective. And then Ron Plurd, who is also from Dell Technologies, a consortium innovator who works in BITS organization, was helping answer some questions in the chat as well. So uh, another great session. Then the last presentation of the consortium was on self-service measures. Measures are always a hot topic. They're very complex. Uh, everybody does it different. Over the last year, a uh, host of consortium member companies have come together to start talking about how do you measure success within a channel, starting with self-service measurement. So 
Amy Dotson from Sage, Christina Rosen from Akamai, and Arne van Ostfjord from the consortium presented on the work of the self-service measurements um, paper that has been released and what Akamai is testing, what Sage is testing, and kind of the work that's been done. One of the things which was a big takeaway and um, I captured because I like this, this three Ds of measures where measures have to be digestible. Everybody, it have to be easy to understand. If it's super complicated, then nobody's gonna understand the measure. And the more complicated you make a measure, the less people actually trust the measure because now they think you're hiding something. If it's so complex, I can't understand how you're getting to it. It has to be durable and able to evolve with the project and the business. So it can't be a measure of the day. Uh, you can't walk in and show a measurement this week and then next week show a different measurement because again, then there's no consistency. And defensible, it has to be backed up by supporting measures and solid logic. So you, you, know, you need to be able to explain where the measure comes from, the data sources for the measure. I like this because if you think through these things when you are designing your measures, they're probably measures that are gonna stick and be more accepted by the business and by the leadership. So the success by channel paper has been released. It's publicly available in the KCS section of the library. And in there really is a template of measures that is being tested by different companies. And they're designed to be, again, to the three, three Ds of measurements, not overly complex. Yes, it can get complex how you get the data and how you design the measure, but they're designed to be fairly, fairly self-explanatory and easy to track over time to see if you're delivering and having engagement within a channel as opposed to trying to get very fancy. And I, the, the simplicity of it is the beauty of it. Um, so the paper is available. It goes through and talks about the reason behind the paper, all the assumptions made, there's a great glossary of terms which the members have agreed to. So when we're saying something, this is what everybody means by it. I think the glossary of terms is almost one of the most powerful things in the paper because if we all use that language, then even if you use a different template, you're still saying the same thing across the industry. And our goal is to bring some consistency across the industry on how we're measuring success by channel of engagement. So absolutely go check that paper out. So just to wrap up some of the resources that are available. So all of the recordings have been posted to the members wiki. So all the presentations and all the videos from the summit have been posted. I believe we've posted most of the content if we have it. We did not record the open space sessions, but the notes and things like that will be posted. The Slack workspace that I talked about is still open and we're planning on leaving it open through the end of October. If there's a lot of engagement still going on, we may extend that and think about, you know, what would a, a member engagement platform like that look like, but we plan on keeping it open through October, maybe a little bit longer. Obviously, Service Innovation is a great place to go. The Members Only Wiki um, and then the Member Summit 2020 uh, area of the wiki. Anybody who attended the member summit will have access to the member summit part of the wiki, even if you're a non-member, but all members have access to all of the content. KCSAcademy.net, there's some great new training out there on the academy.net. Uh, new KCS V6 fundamentals has been released, uh, kind of updating the, the old one. So check it out. There are some short clips of the trainings on the website and it talks a little bit about path to follow in terms of, you know, things management should be engaged in, things knowledge workers should be engaged in, and it's, it's really well done. Continuing to evolve as we live, we live that reuse and on demand is how we live. So we're uh, continuing to work on these things as people use them, we'll update things as, as we need to. There's three new publicly available resources in the KCX section of the library. I talked about the understanding success by channel. The Measurement Matters V6 paper is out there. And then a lot of work has been done on knowledge domain analysis reference guide. So those three things are available in the KCS section of the library and are publicly available to anybody who wants, wants to get at them. We do have some upcoming events. Um, the KCS Aligned Vendor Series 
so we've kicked off a, a new series to kind of give some of the aligned vendors and service vendors and tool vendors a platform to talk about kind of how they engage with KCS. So this will be done by the vendors and the first one will be Bonnie Chase by Caveo. Most of them are bringing a customer to talk about what they've done, but it really is allowing people, if you're using Caveo, it's designed for you to go learn about Caveo and we'll be hosting more from the other vendors like ServiceNow and Salesforce and DBK and others to talk about what they do. So we're giving them a platform to do that through the Academy. There's a KCS in action call coming up, building a strategic framework uh, by Kai in Germany. And, you know, Kai has a lot of experience dealing with senior level management executives and building strategic frameworks and driving things like that. So super interesting to talk to him about what you have to think through when building a strategic framework. So he's going to uh, present on that in the KCS in action call. And then in, towards the end of October, knowledge as a service a team meeting uh, for consortium members. And again, this is a, a pretty broad topic, but really starting to think through some of this value and that knowledge is a service that you can deliver. It's not just KCS. Knowledge is very broad. And how can we look at that as a service deliverable or knowledge as a service in itself? And at the leadership committee meeting last year, really started to have some discussions being driven by a couple member companies that really feel you need to have a separate from your support and services organization, a knowledge as a service organization that manages knowledge across the entire enterprise. And Dell does some things like that. PTC is playing with some things like that. So a few companies are playing with this idea that knowledge is a service. And so we're gonna explore that in this team meeting. And that's for members only. These are all available on the serviceinnovation.org events page uh, for people to sign up for. And if you're looking for any upcoming workshops or offer things being offered by the Global Network of Trainers, the kcsacademy.net events has a list of all the upcoming workshops and things being delivered by trainers. Or if you wanna reach out to a trainer, you, know, you can request, um, request somebody to reach, reach back out to you. So, uh, resource there for everybody to use. And we ended thinking about the fact that, you know, 2020 is kind of the year where change became real. And in 2018 and 2019, we were talking about, you know, KCS is the great enabler. Well, KCS became truly the great enabler in 2020. Intelligent swarming was being played with by a few companies. Then all of a sudden everybody's distributed and how do I engage my employees? How do I open up this unbounded network? Intelligence forming helps you really open up an unbounded network to get access to a really large set of smart people with a lot of information without a lot of processes and heavy weight on top of them. Adaptive organizations, we're all living in adaptive organizations these days. So we kind of ended it saying year, you know, 2020 is the year when this change became real for everybody. So let's take some of the models that the consortiums developed and, and the members are, are using and let's go out and play and explore with some of these things and then come back and you know, advance all of our thinking on these innovative techniques. And that was how we ended the, the meeting. But overall, I would like to thank all of the people that attended the member summit all the people that are engaged with the consortium and the academy, the network of people out there, you're what makes the consortium real and helps make all these models work. Um, the staff of the consortium helps pull together information and pull together people. But the only reason any of, any of these things work is because of the community and the members out there that go and test these models and move them forward. So I wanted to thank everybody that attended the member summit, made it so successful, as well as all the people in our extended community. I thought that was a great, a great recap, Matt. You know, we covered a lot of, a lot of topics. There were a lot and of topic, topics covered. Yeah, I did post um, both the links to the event pages in the chat. People want to sign up or see what's available. Great. All right, well, if there are no questions, 
can always feel free to reach out to us via email um, directly to any of us or to the, uh, what is it? Support at? Support serviceinnovation.org. And we will get back to you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.